welcome to the lecture sessions on transmission and distribution under the aegis of the e Sikshana program of VTU. I am Professor Umar Rao, a retired professor from RV College of Engineering, bringing you these lectures. So, in the previous session, we saw about the sagging of the line and the effect of wind and ice. In this session, we will take it forward and see different aspects of protection of the line. So we will be looking at vibration dampers, how to protect against lightning and the use of ground wires and different types of insulators and the materials used in them. So the wind pressure when we were doing SAG, we saw that it has a transverse pull. So this wind not only causes a horizontal swing, but it also causes vibrations in the vertical plane. If these vibrations are within the safe limits, we will not have any issue. And however, these vibrations can at times be so large that the line will snap. These vibrations are of two types. They are called as Aeolian vibrations and gallop vibrations. Aeolian vibrations are caused by aerodynamic forces generated due to the wind like how you have on the wings of an airplane. They are of higher frequency as compared to galloping but they are of low magnitude. So you will just find a small vibration in the lines. So the frequency is of the order of 5 to 150 hertz and magnitude is around 2 to 6 centimeters with a loop length of around 1 to 10 centimeters. So 2 to 6 centimeters is not large. Okay. So it is generally caused when the velocity of wind is low around 4 to 15 kilometers per hour. It is self-exciting means it just picks up in the presence of wind and uh, thereby it causes cracks on the conductors and cause, causes damage to them. We can reduce this type of vibration by using what are called as dampers or we can use armor or reinforcement to reduce the vibrations. An aeolian vibration armor rod prevents flashover. So you can see these are the dampers. So you can see the dampers are provided. Let's look at a very interesting video on vibrations. And I would like to acknowledge YouTube for making this available for the public and for letting us use it.
next have what is called as galloping and this happens when the wind blows over the conductors it causes galloping similar to vibrations it is of low frequency around one fourth to one and a half hertz and the magnitude is higher around 10 meters so jumps huge jumping so what happens is it can break break the line galloping can break the line so the vibrations are caused by the wind blowing over conductors that are not circular so in general when we design the conductors we design them to be circular to avoid galloping normally the conductors will have a horizontal configuration of the three faces to avoid the effect of galloping we can also use stranded conductors wound on pvc to make the conductor circular very often galloping breaks the conductors and if the conductors are close to each other then there is all chance that they may touch each other and cause a flashover sometimes this effect of galloping is also called as the dancing of conductors we have a very good video again from the youtube on galloping lines so let's thank youtube for this wonderful video which beautifully picturizes the effect of galloping and you will see why galloping is also called as dancing when you look at this video when strong winds blow across power lines, they can cause them to lift and bounce, also known as galloping. This puts extra stress on the poles and crossings, sometimes causing them to break. Galloping lines can happen in any season, but they're most common when there's a heavy buildup of freezing rain, ice, or frost. Transmission lines are built to withstand galloping, but in extreme conditions, even they can receive significant damage. If you see galloping lines, remember to stay clear. Broken ice or equipment falling from the lines could hurt you. To learn more about the cause of outages, visit sasspower.com slash outages. Proceeding further, we have lightning. All of us are very familiar with lightning. So what happens in lightning? There is an electrical discharge between the cloud and the earth or between two clouds. And this causes the air to break down and you have what we see the lightning the lightning discharge so these are large surges large surges and they get injected into the power system through long overhead lines this is a serious issue and the results can be catastrophic on the consumer equipment if these surges reach the equipment through the utility in fact, there was a very interesting case way back around three decades ago when computers were fairly new and there were a whole lot of new computers installed in the Indian Institute of Science and during heavy rain, lightning and thunderstorm, the next morning, almost over 100 computers, the motherboards were destroyed. So, you can see that the lighting will have a very dramatic effect on the equipment. Normally, the ground wires are provided to protect the lines. So, if I have a conductor, that is my transmission line, I'll have a ground wire above it so that the lightning strikes the ground wire and the ground wire will be connected to the ground so the discharge is grounded and the lines are protected from the lightning strike. So these ground wires will not allow a path to form between the line conductor and the ground. Simple, this type of protection is called as shielding, shielding method. So ground wires are just bare conductors supported at the top of the transmission towers higher than the main conductor. It has to be above that so that the lightning strikes the ground wire before it strikes the transmission lines so what do these ground wires do they serve to shield the line intercept the lightning stroke before it hits 
the current carrying conductors below. And these ground wires are solidly grounded at each tower both in the transmission system and also in the distribution system. In horizontal arrangement of lines because they will be spread out over a longer distance, two ground wires are normally used. When the conductors are placed vertically one below the other, one ground wire would be sufficient. Normally the ground wires do not carry any current, so they are meant for protection. So what sort of conductors can you use? You can use steel and ACSR conductors. So when there is a direct lightning stroke, the ground wire obstructs the stroke and reduces the induced voltage by providing numerous paths for conducting the stroke to the ground. Normally when lightning occurs, the strokes are repeated. So you have a leader stroke and after that a number of smaller strokes strike one after the other. So what are the features which the ground wire should have? First, it should be robust and capable of providing sufficient shielding. And there should be enough clearance between the power conductors and the towers. To avoid flashover, there should be adequate clearance between the line conductors and the ground wire. Otherwise, a flashover can occur if the ground wire is too close to the line wire. A flashover can occur between the ground wire and the line wire. That is also not desirable. And there should be allowable tower foot resistance. So this is the resistance between the metal parts of the tower and the ground resistance. So it is very important for protection against lightning. Normally for each EHV lines, the tower foot resistance is around 20 ohms. And for HV lines, it is around 8 to 10 ohms. This video shows you how the lightning strikes and how you have a leader strike and a number of smaller strikes following it. Again, thanks to YouTube for making it available for us. Fox cameraman moved out of the way and into safe positions and some shots of these lightning bolts were scary stuff. And that happened right near the 18th green again. Our locked cameras caught that bolt. And let me just tell you, it wasn't too far from our booth. That is a live look at the tree. And it was shook. That's all. So you have seen the three issues with overhead lines. That is vibrations, galloping, and lightning. We can also provide protection against lightning by using so many other devices such as lightning conductors, lightning arresters, spear gaps, etc. So you would study in detail about them in your course on protection and switch gear. Now let's move on to insulators. So what are insulators used for? The overhead line insulators are used to separate line conductors from each other and the supporting structures electrically. Right? Otherwise, flashovers will occur. Insulators protect the transmission line from over voltages which occur due to lightning, switching or other severe weather conditions. Insulators obstruct the flow of unwanted current to the earth from its supporting points. It acts as a high resistive path through which no current can flow. So you know in materials you have three broad classes that is conductors, semiconductors and insulators. Conductors are very good conduct conductors of electricity. Semiconductors are having a much lower conductivity and insulation have very poor conductivity or they are highly resistive. So failures due to flashover which occurs between the line and earth during abnormal over voltage in the system is prevented. Sometimes 
the heat that is produced due to the flash over will rupture the insulator body also. So we now know what an insulator is used for, right? So what properties should it have? First is, they must be robust to carry the tension and weight of the conductors. You will see when we see the insulators that the conductors will be connected to them through some mechanical arrangements and so they must be able to bear the weight of the conductors that is the transmission lines. They must have very high dielectric strength because it should act as an insulator. Resistance should be very high to sustain the voltage stresses in the high voltage system. So the dielectric strength is very important. It should not break down when the voltage gradient is high. They must also have a very high insulation resistance to prevent any leakage current to the ground. The insulating material must be free from impurities and should not have any perforations. It should be non-porous. For those of you who are interested, you can just go through and collect material on some failures of insulators and you'll find some very interesting case studies where insulators have failed because of bird droppings. You know, in some places, especially pigeons are present in large, large numbers. So what happens? The droppings of these birds is acidic. So when the insulator material is porous and has perforations, the acid gets into the material and causes what is called as pitting. And this has led to flashover and failure of insulators. And another important property is both its physical and electrical properties must not change drastically with temperature because I need to use the insulators under all weather conditions. So it should behave the same way as the temperature changes. So what are all the choices I have? The most common material used for insulator is the porcelain. It is economical and the insulators are made from wet processed porcelain. So the basic materials used in porcelain insulators are feldspar, china clay, flint, ball clay and talc. So all these you, insulators you see around generally they are made of porcelain and it is covered with a smooth glaze. So what happens to the glaze? The glaze is smooth. So the water does not stick to it and the water will slip away to shed water. So the glazing prevents the surface from accumulating dust and moisture. So glazing is of utmost importance as any impurity on the surface will reduce the dielectric strength. And glazing will also improve the mechanical strength of the insulator. And the dielectric strength of porcelain is approximately around 60 kilovolts per centimeter. The other commonly used material is glass, annealed and toughened glass. So annealing is a controlled temperature variation process to strengthen materials. So this is mechanically very strong and thermally resistant when compared to common glass. So they have a very high dielectric strength of around 140 kilovolts per centimeter. They also have a long life due to better electrical and mechanical properties. They are more economical, cheaper than porcelain. It has high dielectric strength, high resistivity, low coefficient of thermal expansion. So properties do not change too much with temperature and high tensile strength, a lot of advantages, but then difficult to handle. And it is transparent, so it does not get heated up in sunlight. And you can easily detect any flaws in the glass because the glass is transparent and it has a long service. But moisture can easily condense on the glass surface, leading to accumulation of air dust.
on the wet glass surface which can provide leakage path to currents and glass is difficult to handle. So you do not find too many of glass insulators nowadays. The next material used is polymers. They are non-ceramic. Polymer insulators are non-ceramic and because they use polymer they are lightweight, less chance of breakage, great flexibility in design because easily molded as compared to ceramic insulators. They have greater durability, lower cost and look good, pleasing design. You can have them in different colors. So one of the polymers which is becoming very popular and which is very popularly used is silicone, silicone rubber and it is used at high voltages also. So what are the properties of silicone? It is explosion proof for maximum safety, doesn't explode, non-brittle unlike porcelain, ceramic, glass, it's not brittle. So you have reduced risk of handling. So normally, you know, when you handle, handle an insulator, try to place it, connect the conductors, etc. There's always chance of breaking when the material is brittle. So this reduces what we call as handling damages. And it has, it is hydrophobic. That means doesn't like water. So doesn't absorb water. And hence the leakage current control is very good. Excellent insulation and good flashover resistance and outstanding seismic performance. That means very stable under seismic activities like earthquakes. So more reliable and safe. Very important low weight. So easy to handle and more or less if the material is of good quality, it is maintenance free and has got very good performance under pollution and very stable under ultra high voltages also. So now you can see here the insulators of different materials. So here you have porcelain, you have glass of different colors and this is silicone polymer. So you can see the sizes itself, the polymers, they are lightweight and I'm sure you would have seen all this when you travel. So these are very commonly seen everywhere, the brown colored insulators we have and they'll be shining. So they have a glaze, that's the glaze to improve the strength and the resistivity of the insulator. Silicone is transparent, looks good and now many many countries they are slowly replacing all the older insulators with silicone for aesthetic purposes. So now that we know about the materials let's move on to meet our next objective that is to learn about the different types of insulators. The pin type, suspension type, strain, post, stay and shackle insulator. So the pin type insulators are the most common. What you see, pin and suspension type you would have seen everywhere. So it looks like this. Okay. So this hanging, this is called as the petticoat. This is called as the petticoat. So there is a groove. There is a groove. So the conductor is placed through that. You can see. And you will have a pin at the bottom, a galvanized steel pin. So you can pass the conductor through that. I'm sure all of you would have seen this type of insulator. So it consists of a single and multiple armor type structure connected in parallel and ascended on a cross arm of the pole. So the sheds or petticoat, you know, you know that curved structure is called as the petticoat or shed. They have to be designed in such a way that even when the outer surface is wet, the inner surface is dry. So. The water, if it falls, it should fall off, tapered off. Like, like we have sloping roofs to taper off the water. A pin or a bolt is used to clamp the insulator to cross arm on the pole. And it is used for medium voltage levels. And for high voltage, it is expensive. So 
Pin insulators are used for supporting the line conductors. And normally voltage ratings of up to 11 kV use one insulator, up to 25 kV two insulators and up to 44 you can use three or four pieces. For more than 33 kV they become bulky and we go for other type the suspension type of insulators. So the advantages are of the pin insulator are it is simple in construction, economical and supports the line conductors efficiently and it is compact. Disadvantage is it becomes expensive for higher voltages and very heavy and hence not economical but good for voltages up to 33 kV. Next we have the suspension type insulators. So these are used in high voltages for more than 33 kV. You would have all seen this very common. So it consists of a number of discs connected in series. So as you go on adding the discs, as you go on adding the discs, the insulation will be provided against higher voltages. So the conductor is present at the lower end and its other end is suspended from the cross arm on the pole. So what does the design involve? The design involves on how many discs do I need to provide insulation at a particular voltage. Mainly it is that. And what should be the size of these insulators? Size of the insulator means what? We are not going to talk of dimensions. We are going to say the voltage. So I need three discs with a voltage strength of 11 kV. So that's how we design. They are costlier than the pin type insulators. And they do provide partial protection against lightning when used in conjunction with steel towers. Since the conductors run below the cross arm of the tower. So you see, this is how it is. I'm sure you would have all seen suspensions like this. Number of discs. So this is three discs. This is around seven discs. So as you go on adding the discs, the withstand voltage also increases. This is the cross arm. Next we have strain type insulators. So what these do is they are designed to work in the mechanical tension to withstand the pull of a suspended electric wire or cable. So I have an electric wire or cable this will have a pull horizontal pull. So insulators are provided the strain insulators to hold them for the strain which is being felt by the insulator. They are used in overhead electrical wiring to support say radio antennas and overhead power lines. They are used when lines are subjected to greater tension, strain at dead ends, an abrupt ending or when there is a turnover. See when the line takes a turn, you know. So there at the edge, you will have a lot of strain, curves, sharp curves, there will be strain. So when there is a sudden change in the direction of the line. So in such cases, strain type insulators are used. So they minimize the tension on the line. So when the tension is really high, you can use a string of insulators. Two or more strings can be used in parallel. See, this is how it is. Now look at this figure. You can see. So this horizontal insulators, these. So they are the strain insulators. They are the strain insulators. So they are designed with porcelain or glass or fiberglass and it will include the supporting hardware and the cables. The insulator shape will reduce the space between the two cables. Other name for this is shackle type and tension type. They all mean the same shackle insulator, strain insulator. They are all used whenever there is a lot of tension in the line. Now with insulators, we have a very interesting phenomenon called insulator flashover. An electric discharge over or around the surface of an inductor, sorry, an insulator 
is called as an insulator flashover. So the leakage current is caused by mainly atmospheric conditions, dirt, pollution, salt, moisture, which make the surface of the insulator conducting, rain, hail, all this. So we do design it with some slope to taper off, but whatever the design is, there will still be something retaining. And these weather conditions lead to a flashover of the high voltage insulator. Now we define something called the leakage distance or the creepage distance as the shortest path on the surface of an insulation over which leakage current may flow. Let's see what it is. So you see you have a string, a suspension insulator with many discs. So the leakage current can flow like this. Okay, this is called as a creepage or leakage distance. Creepage or leakage distance. So let's look at this video by YouTube and acknowledge their effort in making it available to us. So in this video, you can see how the insulation flyshower occurs. This is one more video on insulator flashover again from YouTube and here you can see that the damage is heavy much more than what you saw in the previous video. I am sure the two videos you saw would have drawn your attention to the potential damage insulation flashover can cause. You just look at these insulators and what they look like. So here you can see it is complete, the material is completely ruptured because of the flashover. And these are all images when the flashover is occurring. You can see here leakage current. So it's no longer an insulator, there is current flowing between the discs. And you saw what damage can be caused by that. So how can I reduce chances of the flashover? So I can increase the leakage distance by increasing number of units, but then that would increase the cost. The insulators can be covered with a semiconductor glaze. So the leakage current through the semiconductor heats up the insulator and it will keep it warm so that moisture doesn't get deposited on that. So this is very useful in places close to the sea where you have a lot of both salt and moisture and periodic washing with high pressure water. Of course you can see this is not an easy task. So you need people going up and you need high pressure nozzles to clean the insulators and how many insulators we have in the system. So it's not an easy task. Again, you can clean it with high pressure abrasive material. So rub it with an abrasive material so that any deposits will come off. And replacing porcelain insulators with ceramic. Or you just cover the insulator with a thin coat of silicone. And we saw silicone is hydrophobic, doesn't like water. Earlier they used to cover the insulator with grease but this is not used nowadays because we have better options like glazing and covering with silicon and what, it, what grease used to do is the same thing. It would let the water slip off but then maintenance is a major problem and so it is not much in vogue nowadays. So we saw the major types, pin insulator, suspension ins insulators, strain insulators. These three are the major types of insulators. There are some more specific ones. One is called as a post insulator. It acts as a support for bus bars in transformer substation yards. Or as support for circuit breakers and capacitor banks. So there are IEC and ANSI standards for designing of post insulators. 
so you can use it up to 1100 kb it is mainly composed of silicon rubber or sometimes porcelain it is extensively used in different applications because of its excellent mechanical properties so you see this is how so you have a bus bar so bus bar as support for the bus bar you have the post insulators so this is silicon this is porcelain okay so the insulators that is the post insulators can be used in areas where the atmosphere includes large quantities of corrosive gases such as sulfuric and nitrous nitrogenous compounds indoor post insulators can also be installed in any chosen position and outdoors the post insulators can be placed horizontally or vertically depending on what is the space available so normally aluminium clamps are used for fixing the bus parts to the post insulators so they have a higher number of petticoats petticoats are those sheds and can we have we can have it at greater heights so this insulator is normally made of one piece of porcelain and as i told you before it has a clamping arrangement both at the top and the bottom for fixing we have lastly stay insulators these are normally used in the distribution lines and they are available in smaller sizes compared to what we discussed the suspension strain and all that they are designed to provide insulation in case the wire breaks and falls to the ground okay this will for the stay wires what are stay wires stay wires you can see here this so you see i have a pole i have two wires what do those wires do those wires provide tension to hold the pole in position i'm sure all of you would have seen this on all the roadside poles okay so similarly here you see here these are called as the stay wires so the stay insulators are provided there to provide support to the stay wires that's why it's called as a stay insulator so they are designed to provide insulation in case the stay wire breaks and falls to the ground so the stay insulator will ensure that the stay wires don't touch the ground the importance of stay wire stay type insulator is usually witnessed when the pole falls on the ground or when the stay wires accidentally break due to maybe mechanical stress or wind or whatever and these are mostly mostly made of porcelain cheaper than using other materials a usual stay insulator has two holes that are placed on opposite sides of each other so the stay wire will enter at one end and be taken out at the other end so you can use guy wires to support the grip so i need to tie it right so they are called as guy wires so when the wire the stay wire falls on the ground it will be completely insulated so it will prevent lot of accidents electrocution right i think you got the picture see this is how it looks there will be holes punched for the guide wire to be inserted and this is how it will be inserted you can see this is the guide wire it is inserted through the porcelain this is the stay porcelain insulator so we have covered the different types of insulators we have seen the different materials that are used in the insulators now let us see a few design aspects of suspension type of insulators so there what we have if you recollect we have a number of discs mounted one on top of the other mounted one on top of the other so first we will see how is the voltage distributed between the discs do all the discs have the same voltage or is the voltage different 
and if it is different can i keep it same by some manipulation and since we are using insulating materials there will definitely be some capacitance so what are the different capacitances and what is the efficiency of a string of insulators how do i calculate the efficiency of a string of insulators first of all how do i define it so these are some of the things we will study in this session normally whenever i have disks stacked one on top of the other from a manufacturing perspective it makes sense to have all disks of the same type identical disks right so if one disk gets damaged i can remove it and just put another one i don't have to remove the replace the whole insulator that particular disk can be replaced so normally in string insulators the suspension type the strings are identical so you would expect the capacitance of each unit to be same this is called as the self capacitance or mutual capacitance and is normally denoted by c so what is c c is the capacitance of each unit so if v is the total voltage across all the disks and i have n disks then you would expect the voltage across each disk to be v by n equal distribution because the disks are identical okay but this is not the story what happens i also have capacitance between the fitting of each disk and the ground or the supporting structure which could be a tower clear so i have the self capacitance of the disk and i also have a capacitance between each disk and the ground this is called as the shunt capacitance and is denoted by c1 so in the next session let's see what are the issues caused by this